Okay, good morning, and <clears throat> we are going to uh, continue on in Mark chapter 13. I've uh, been going verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, and uh, I, I, I slowed down around this curve here because the transition between Mark 12 and Mark 13 is, I think it's pretty big because Jesus um, turns toward uh, prophecy, and that's, that's kind of a good picture, I think, you know, coming around a, a curve and uh, not racing into this, into this text. It's a grand text. It's, it's, it's um, as you'll see this morning, we will um, not be covering it all because uh, it, there's a lot, a lot there. And as we see the things going on in this world, man, looking at California, looking at the earthquakes and the, it's Quakeageddon or whatever they were calling it, uh, like, yeah, it's like constant. It made front page, of course, it should, I think, something like that, where the earthquakes are just nonstop going on. And well, the Bible talks about these things, you know, the Bible talks about the future and, and sometimes we don't. We don't think about that. Um, so this morning, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to take a lesson from, from the disciples who were willing to be students of Bible prophecy. The disciples of Jesus were very interested. They were keen, if you will, in hearing what God had to say about the future. They believed in what he had to say, they, in, in his words that he knew and he understood, you know. So they, they saw him uh, say things before when he mentioned Lazarus. He says that, you know, God is going to be glorified. It's not the time yet. And then they're going, what? And a few days later, he raises him from the dead. You know, and the amazing things that they saw. So um, I'm going to pray now, and then I'm going to actually give a long introduction to pro uh, the section in Bible prophecy. And then Steve's going to come up and read the text with us, and then um, we'll go into a couple of the verses after that. Lord, we thank you for this time and ask that you would help our hearts to be uh, available to your instruction and that we would just um, learn of you. And we thank you, you're gentle, you're lowly, and that you take burdens uh, that are ours onto yourself, and you, you want to give us rest for our souls. You're a good shepherd and you're a, you're a good teacher. And uh, we ask that you'd overlook my weaknesses and minister to us this morning. And um, Jesus, you be glorified in our lives. We give you praise. Amen. So last week we looked at the uh, words of Jesus in Mark 13, verse 2. And we looked at verse 1, where I see what manner of stones and buildings are here. And remember that, we were looking at how large the stone was and it covered this entire section, half of this whole area here and just so large. And, and Jesus said, do you see these great buildings? In Mark 13, verse two, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus spoke about the future. He told them what was going to happen. He told them this temple, everything you see here, the physical is gonna be totally radically changed soon. And that was as incredible. And, and now I, I simply, in my studies in verse three and four, I couldn't get past verse three and four, to tell you the truth. I, mean, I keep reading this section and digesting the whole section and I, I write some notes on thoughts I have and so forth, but um, I, I just had to say, okay, that's, that's enough. I'm gonna hit the brakes after verse four because verse three and four, let's go ahead and read that now. Mark 13, 3, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, probably because they were the ones that were close to him. They didn't necessarily take him aside. They were just the ones that were there. Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? So the disciples, here they are uh, near Jesus and they're still thinking about it because they had taken a walk from the time Jesus said that to where they're at now up on the hillside of the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. And I'll share with you that scene in a moment. But they just get this into your minds. These disciples were ready to be students of God's words. They were ready to be students of prophecy more specifically and what Jesus said. And again, I, I think we should consider that today. I want us to, uh, that the disciples are super interested in what Jesus has to say about future events. 
and I'm a disciple of Jesus, and you're a disciple of Jesus, and, and should we be interested in what Jesus has to say about future events, the word prophecy or uh, fore, foretelling of the future, the knowledge of God who knows all things, he's gonna share with mankind truth. Now, the disciples, think about this, they had understanding of many of the prophecies of the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament yet, right? It's being written as the scene is happening. And they had, they had some understanding. The, the prophecies in the Old Testament, there's so many of them. And they wanted to know about Jesus, who they believe is the Messiah spoken of from the Old Testament. And they want to know about his kingdom. They really want to know about his kingdom. And so they took what he said as fact. They believed him. And they didn't understand how or when it was all going to happen. And that's what they're asking about whoa, all these buildings and stones are going to be thrown down. Like shocking statement. How is that going to happen? When's that going to happen? What's it going to be like? How will we know when that is going to start taking place? Whoa. So they're students of God's word. I think we should be too. Let's take a lesson from them. Uh, and you may think, be a student of prophecy? Yikes. You know, I... I who am I to be a student of prophecy? Isn't that for like really serious Bible thumpers? Isn't that for like people who are really, really like they understand the Bible and they go deep into the Bible and, or you think I can't understand all that or, or, or you think, uh, you know, I don't know why I should study it. Why should I study prophecy? I just, I've got enough to think about now. Thinking about prophecy is just gonna like make me worry about more stuff or something. Maybe that's your concept. Or maybe you heard some negative um, negative ideas about prophecy. And you think, no, like, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna go there. You know, I met some people that were into prophecy and they're weird, you know? Have you ever met anyone that's into prophecy and they're weird? Yeah, I met you, Cameron, or something. No, no, come on, be nice. But there's, there, let's face it, it's, it's true, you know? I, there are some people that are into prophecy and, uh, and there is some really weird stuff out there. I mean, really weird. I could, I could tell you some stuff, you think, oh, that's, really weird you know uh it, it gets into it's out there flat earth and you way beyond that stuff like way beyond it so it, it kind of freaks some people out to tell you the truth the idea of studying prophecy and thinking about it some people get really intense you know and some people live they live in fear when they think about prophecy and some of these things it was not meant to put anyone in fear or confusion Prophecy wasn't meant to confuse people or put them in fear. Not at all. I think if they're biblically studying it, as Jesus would have us understand, then, then, then it's going to be healthy for us all. It's going to be good. You know, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, all, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's, it's been prophetically given. All prophecy has been given so that we might may be equipped for every good work. It, it should practically bless us and encourage us. And God only gives us some understanding. He doesn't give us all the understanding, but he gives us what we need to know. What he thinks we should know, he wants to share with us, okay? Not everything, but some information. It's like, I love the, uh, the, uh, this metaphor. Corey Tin Boom shared it when she was a young girl and her father was with her and, and they were going to go on the train and she asked where her ticket was. And uh, he spoke about her baggage and so forth and said to her, well, this, see this bag, it's, it's too heavy for you to carry. And I'll carry your ticket for you as well to make sure you don't lose it. And he carried her baggage for her because she was small. And uh, it was a beautiful picture just sharing with her that, you know, we don't have to carry the knowledge of everything. We don't have to be the embodiment of all understanding. Or like e even um, my assurance of salvation is not something because I do it. The Lord has it in his hands. And anyhow, prophecy, uh, let, let's, let's move forward here. I, I was reading in John F. Woolvard's uh, book, The Rapture Question, which uh, subtitle, A Comprehensive Biblical Study on the Translation of the Church. By the way, rapture is a resurrection. If you believe in the resurrection, you believe in a rapture at some point. It's just the, you believe in a resurrection. Maybe if rapture is getting a weird word, uh, becoming a weird word. Hey, I believe in the resurrection. I, do you, you don't believe in a resurrection? 
You know, oh, I don't believe in a rapture. You mean you don't believe in a resurrection? Oh, I believe in a resurrection. Okay, then you do believe in a not rapture. It's, it's, it, we're going to be taken up at some point. A resurrection is going to happen, right? So um, anyhow, anyway, I'm reading this book uh, last week. And in, in, the, in the preface, Wolverd has this to say. In this generation, there has been much discussion on the uh, relation of the coming of Christ to the predicted time of tribulation which will overtake the world. More questions are being asked today than ever before concerning the return of the Lord. The second coming has always been prominent in fundamentalist literature, but the surprising revival of interest on the part of the modern liberal and the neo-orthodox writers is something new. That was written in 1952. Okay, so 70 years ago, what Wolvert is saying, and I think he had a good finger on the pulse of, of Christendom, if you will, being in Dallas Theological Seminary and all this stuff. Like, he, he knew what was going on. He did that full time for a long time. And he says there was a real increase in interest in Bible prophecy. Now, that was 70 years ago. Do you think today... There's as much interest in Bible prophecy. Now, some of you say, I, I think there is. That's only because you're running in some small circles. I think at large, there's not. I would venture to say, at least in our city, but beyond that, I believe that the interest today in Bible prophecy has waned. It has gone, it is, it is slumped. I think that it's down. Turn in your Bibles quickly with me. It's not going to be on the screen, but turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, please. 2 Peter chapter 3, just before the book of Revelation, just before 1 John, um, you've got 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse, yeah, verse 3, actually. 2 Peter 3, 3, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. When are mockers or scoffers going to come? Specific scoffers. They're going to come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. And here's what they're going to say. Here's their message. Verse 3, chapter 4, or chapter 3, verse 4. Where is the promise of his coming? So that's all I want us to see right now in that section. Back to Mark. Now, now 2 Peter 3, the skeptics are going to ask in the last days, where's the promise of his coming? That's not happening. And I think maybe in the last 50 to 70 years, that feeling has, has been put out there because Bible prophecy was huge in the 60s, huge in the 70s, huge in the 80s. Bible prophecy was big. Everybody was interested in it. And I think maybe, you know, since, uh, since the tribulation force or one of those books, you know, that came out, those... Those ones that I think left behind series. I think it gave kind of, I mean, maybe they were good books. I didn't read them, but my opinion is yeah, not of the best, but I think it kind of gave a black eye to some of the ideas of prophecy. Like that is so lame. Really? You know, I, how's that work? And this is hokey and this, and this is just kind of, and maybe it's not just that, but I think people got tired. Maybe the inundation of them. I, mean, I don't know, but it, I think it waned. I think it has today, looking around. I get the sense that it's not prophecy and the teaching and thoughts of it aren't strong. At least where we live. It is downplayed. At large, in Christian circles, pastors' conferences I go to, hey, I was at a, a, a small pastor's retreat on Thetis Island in March, and uh, Steve and I were in a room together with a couple other pastors. And remember, when pro the prophecy came up in that, that night. And these other t two other pastors and, and churches in, in different places in Vancouver and then somewhere in the interior, yeah, they, they both were like, we will not talk about prophecy. They were both like, nope, not talking about it. No way. You young bucks think you know, you know, you just give it 20 years. You won't care about it anymore. It was, it was like a cynical, sad attitude. It's like, man, that's what I have to look forward to in my faith? <laughs> Just someone hit the freeze button on my life, please, because I don't want to be there in 20 years. It was really down, it's downplayed. It's often dismissed as having no practical significance. Now, I, I don't know Rick Warren. I don't have anything to do with Rick Warren, but 
I, I will give you this quote from The Purpose Driven Life, a, a very, very popular book that, that was put out there, right? This is in his book, okay? And uh, he mocks Bible prophecy. He actually scoffs at it. He says, quote, if you want Jesus to come back sooner, focus on fulfilling your mission, not figuring out prophecy. And then he goes on to characterize prophecy as a distraction, quote, distract, he calls it a distraction. It says anyone that, who lets himself get involved in distractions like studying prophecy, quote, is not fit for the kingdom of God. Ouch, ouch. And I'm I, like, again, I don't know if he's changed his mind or whatever else. I'm not here to slander a guy or whatever, but that's quoted in a book. It's out there, right? And that, that just kind of tells you the feeling that's out there. And I don't know if it's because of the social justice movements in, in the Western society, social justice, social justice. And they're saying, you know what? Let's get practical. None of the pie in the sky stuff. Stop being so heavenly minded and you're no earthly good. Let's actually do something that helps people. And yes, the church has always, you know, had like, oh, we're weak in this area. We're strong in this area. We're inflated in this area. We're deflated in this area. And we need to like practice what we preach and, and go out and share and so forth. I don't know. But... Um, Prophecy is often mocked, uh, a general attitude toward it is mocked as escapism. It's mocked as impractical and so forth, right? The Bible actually says in the New Testament, pray that you may escape these things. So if I'm an escapist, fine. The Bible says to pray that you may escape it, you know, but I'm not doing that so I can't escape. I, I don't, I don't want to be under uh, the wrath or judgment of God when the, when he brings down justice. No way. So yeah, I'd like to escape that. Well, like, what, why wouldn't you? Anyways, um, and I want as many people not to be under that as possible. But, you know, I have seen it where people start to look into prophecy. They start getting afraid. Their life becomes more, more fearful. They, they um, you know, they think everything that happens in the news is a sign. You know, it's happening. Y2K. Do you guys remember Y2K? Yeah, Y2K, it's, ah, you know, it's happening. It's like, people were making money on that. Preppers. Yeah, it's just like, it was, it's craziness. Um, so there, there is some unstable stuff out there. And it, 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 people get very, can get unrelatable to society. And... Um, yeah, they, 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 they kind of hole up and, and get afraid of every, every single thing. And yes, there's fearful things going to happen, but prophecy isn't given to make us afraid uh, uh, of what the Lord has for us, but to warn us, encourage us. And we'll get into that with the coming text here in the next few weeks, that what Jesus tells the disciples is a lot of applications of how they should know and, and behave and learn, really. And by the way, I just got to mention this, YouTube. Like, it, there is so much messed up stuff on YouTube. Now, there's some good stuff, but it's a needle in a haystack a lot of times. Unless you really know a reputable prophecy teaching, then don't just randomly type something in. Because, like, get some advice from a solid believer. Get some advice. Like, who, who can I look, like, listen to? You know, it, it, it's like someone just turns on the so-called Christian TV channel and just like assumes that's Christianity, right? It's like, no, that guy in the white suit hitting people and screaming at them is not Christianity. Ask, telling them to give him his money or whatever. That's, that's horrible, horrible, horrible witness of Jesus, right? And, and there's a lot of stuff on prophecy out there that if you keep watching, it just goes, it starts like, okay, he's got something good to say. And he, they hook you in and then it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And pretty soon there's breeding programs uh, in Antarctica and Hitler began this other thing. And it's like, what are you talking about, right? And then I, I rebuked the, one of the greatest evangelists of our time, I can't, you know, and just like, they're, they're like insane. And it's so weird. Um, you can tell I've watched some of it and I'm telling you not, <laughs> and I'm telling you not to. <laughs> Don't do what I, I have done. Oh my goodness, please read the Bible more than, than that. So there's some good productions, but there's, for every good one, there's a hundred bad ones. There really are. Because people want followings and then they don't have one. And so they, they put themselves on YouTube and then they get an internet world following. 
but they probably can't even have a good relationship with people around them. You know what I mean? They can't get along with people even in the fellowship of the body of Christ. So um, get into the Bible, get into fellowship. That, that's the encouragement. As Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says, as you see the day approaching, encourage each other. Get together as the body of Christ. So that's obviously you're looking at the signs of the times. You're going, man, the Lord could come back. Get together with the body of Christ. Encourage one another. Be strong together. So prophecy study shouldn't replace serving God in the, or being involved with the community. And, and it should be inspiring us towards getting together, Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Studying prophecy shouldn't make us weird or afraid or these things. And so uh, here's why this all concerns me, by the way. It, prophecy is all over the scriptures. It's through and through in the scriptures. It is all over the New Testament, Genesis to Revelation. It's all through the New Testament. It's in the Gospels. It's right here in the Gospels. Prophecy is all over the words of Jesus. Prophecy is all over the epistles. Prophecy is in the book of Acts. You know, the whole Bible is, is, has prophetic words in it. It's incredible. It's unique. And Jesus is the fulfillment and, and instructor of prophecy, especially in this section that we're reading in the Olivet Discourse. It, it, most of all, most importantly, it is about him. So I just wanted to, rather than rewriting all of this, um, I was reading on, and, and I think this is a, a pretty solid place to go, ChristinProphecy.org. It's one of the many, I think, solid ones. So I was, I was reading this reasons for study. And instead of rewriting it all, we'll just, I'll just look through it with you. It's from Lamb and Lion Ministries. Here's 10 reasons he gives for studying prophecy. One, the quantity. One fourth to a third of the Bible is prophetic in nature. Some people will say that half of the Bible or to, to even two thirds of the Bible is related to. Two thirds of the Bible is related to prophecy. That's, that's a huge portion. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, it's all over. I was just sharing that. In the New Testament, it's all over. To ignore Bible prophecy is to ignore a significant portion of God's word. All scripture is given, right? For doctrine, it's profitable. For reproof, correction, for our instruction and in how to live righteously. All scripture is given, including prophecy. Two, the uniqueness of it. This one's great. No other book in the world contains fulfilled prophecies, period. Whoa, that's a strong claim. Can you back that one up? I believe so. No other book in the world contains fulfilled prophecies. This includes the sayings of Buddha and Confucius, the Quran, the Hindu Vedras, and the Book of Mormon. And it certainly includes the ridiculous nonsensical qu uh, quatrains of Nostradamus. What about Nostradamus? <laughs> um, the Bible is very specific in prophecy. Uh, three, validator of scripture. Fulfilled prophecy is one of the best evidences I know of that the Bible is the inspired word of God. God said things would happen before they happened and then they did. Ah, wow, it's the inspired word of God. And so people try to say, oh, that was written here. All this was written here. No, not the case. You've got Dead Sea Scrolls. You've got evidence. Um, anyway, number four, validator of Jesus. The prophetic scriptures validate Jesus as who he said he was, namely God in the flesh. The Bible contains more than 300 prophecies about the first coming of Jesus, uh, and some of those are repetitive. There are actually 109 separate and distinct prophecies concerning the first coming. All of them were fulfilled, literally fulfilled. You know, where he would be born, he would go down to Egypt, all these things, you know? Born, poverty at his, his birth, you know, wealth at his death and so forth, buried with the rich. Every aspect of his life, so much about Jesus, all the prophecies speaking of, pointing to, honing in on Christ, his first and second coming, okay? Revealer of the future, number five, it serves uh, to tell us some things that God wants us to know. And again, he doesn't want us to know everything about the future, but there are some things we must know if we're to have a dynamic hope, <laughs> a dynamic hope. And we'll get, I'll talk about hope in a minute here. Oh, by the way, 2 Peter 1.19. Peter says prophecy is like a lamp that shines in a dark place. World's dark. Ah, prophecy shines like a lamp in a dark place. I don't understand. I thought God was good. Look at this. What's happening? 
A lamp shines in a dark place. Prophecy is like that. Then you'll get it. Oh, light bulb. I understand what's going on. Uh, tool for evangelism, number six. Prophecy can be used as an effective tool for evangelism. It's like, yeah, look at this. God said this would happen. It happened. Wow, is that real? I've got it. People have to intellectually deal with that. That's huge. The fulfillment of prophecies of, of Christ's birth. It's insurmountable, the possibilities that this could be. So if someone has to go, well, he never really existed or these were written after. No, no way. You actually take a hard, cold case look at the facts and people can't deny that the Bible has a lot of prophecy and those prophecies came to pass and they were written before that happened. Um, tool for moral teaching. That's throughout the Bible. The, we often overlook the fact that the Hebrew prophets were forth tellers as well as foretellers and prophets spent most of their time using God's word to spotlight societal problems. Prophecy does deal with uh, behavior and uh, life and it's, it's, it's practical showing what true worship is and so forth. Okay, I'm going to move on. Eight, spiritual growth. It encourages waiting, watching, and we're going to look at that all through uh, Mark 13, the Olivet Discourse. It's all about watch, watch, watch. Be patient, wait, suffer well, have hope. It's all about that. And that results in, in holy living, which is throughout the scripture, um, encouraged by Paul and Peter and John. Like, we're, to, we're to have live, live soberly, you know, and righteously. Uh, number nine, understanding current events. The Bible contains detailed prophecies about the end times we are living in. There's just no way to fulfill and understand much of what's happening today apart from those prophecies. I, I love that. It's like, whoa, you know, weather wars and, and this and going on and that going on and wars and the more, more bloodshed in, you know, the last century than all of history combined and what is going on with this crazy, crazy world? Prophecy. Look at prophecy. God's not forcing anything to happen. He's allowing things to happen and knew they would happen before they happened. But he knows the end and he, he is in control. He remains in control. Uh, I like what it says there. Characteristics, three of them in our day. Intensifying decay of society. Growing apostasy in the church. Escalating crisis in the Middle East. The Bible always said there's crisis in the Middle East. And look where there's crisis. It's like, imagine that, right? Prophesied in detail in the Bible. You know, Damascus one day will be a heap, a ruin, destroyed. Not yet. But it's going to be. When's that going to happen? I don't know, but it's going to happen. Don't buy property in Damascus. <laughs> Signifier of the season, number 10. One of the most exciting reasons for studying Bible prophecy is that it proves, uh, provides very definite signs that we're to watch for. Uh, and they, they, they will tell us the season that the Lord's returning. It's true that we cannot know the date, but the Bible makes it clear we can know the season. If we're aware of the signs, we'll know what to look for. Uh, Paul made this point in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 6, when he wrote, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons uh, of, the, of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. In other words, you know some of the signs of the seasons. You know when summer is here. You know when fall is here. You know when it's winter. And you're not going to be caught unaware. You're not going to go outside without your, you know, your warm boots on and your coat on because you know it's winter. In other words, prophecy is going to help you know what season it is. And it's not going to overtake you as a thief. It's not going to be a surprise. So I think here's the grandest reason we should study prophecy. Revelation 19, verse 10. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is this. What's the spirit of prophecy? What is the spirit of prophecy? You just told me so much of the Bible's about prophecy and there's so many good things about it. Hone in on this. Prophecy is about Jesus. The end of the day, prophecy is about Jesus. And if you're not being directed into a greater relationship and acknowledgement and hope for and desire of Jesus, then you might be a little off track in some of your prophecy 
study. It is about Jesus. And Jesus is immensely practical to everyday living. A relationship with Jesus is completely uh, profitable for all things that we do. Think about this. Prophecy for the believer deals in hope. Richly. I think it's more than that, but think about this. These three. Abide in these three. What are those three? Faith, hope, and love. Right? Faith. Trusting in. Believing in Jesus. You know, evangelism is important. Prophecy, just stop it. I mean, we need to go out there. Yeah, evangelism is important. Trusting in the Lord. Having a good walk is important. Love. We need to love people. Yeah, we do. We need to worship God. Love God with our heart. Love our neighbor as ourself. Acts of service in the body of Christ and beyond. What about hope? Hope is, hope is also very, very important to abide in. If we don't think at all about the Lord's return, if we don't know about the Lord's return, we look at the world and we lose hope, right? If you lose your hope, what are you? Hope less. And ho being hopeless, it's horrible. And our hope is in his promises. There are a lot of promises. So when someone gives a promise, have they given you the goods yet? No. They've promised there will be goods. There will be the, the, the fruit of that promise. The fulfillment of that promise is guaranteed. That's what a promise is. So the Bible's full of promises. Those promises have not, the fulfillment hasn't occurred, but the promise has been given. And so you wait for the promise and trust and love God in the meantime and love your neighbor. Do you see? There's a lot of hope because God's given his word and his word is good. He's not like a man that he should take back his word. He's not like a person who, who, who says he'll do something and doesn't do it. Numbers 23, Numbers 23, chapter, uh, chapter 23, verse 19. He's not a man that he should lie. God says it, he'll do it. He'll make it good. So not studying prophecy is like not knowing there's an entire house of hope for us to go into. There's an entire house full of hope for you to partake of. And you should, it's all for you. And you've got the key to it. And you have a right to go in and enjoy all the fruit of that hope. So from the beginning of the church, uh, they believed in the Lord's return. They believed that the Lord could come back at any time. And they desired that. They had hope in his coming. Because his coming means a restoration of all the things that are wrong. Death is wrong. Sickness is wrong. Murder is wrong. Injustices are wrong. So many things are wrong. Wars, hatred, all the stuff. Racism, it's wrong. And the Lord will redeem the earth. And he will bring justice and truth and righteousness and a kingdom where, where love is the law. And he's going to bring in his kingdom. So there's so much hope in that. And, and the church has always desired that and always longed for that. And every time there's been a revival, it's also included that. A desire for the Lord's return. And, and a belief that, man, that God's going to solve the problems. I can't wait for him to do so. Just a passion, right? So people full of hope, faith, and, and love, driving passion into their lives. Um, I have examples of scriptures for that, but for time's sake, I won't go into it. I think hope is extremely practical and helpful. I think it's super helpful. You know, because when you lose hope, it's, it's, it's not good. So um, that's a very long introduction. Now we have Steve come on up. 30-minute introduction. Eek. Yeah, you got to push the uh, button that's, that's on there. Just go ahead and... You gotta, here, I'll hold your Bible. I'll do that for you. There we go. Thank you, brother. Okay. So, Mark 13. Then, as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? Are here? And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when, these, when, these, uh, when will these things be? 
And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus, answering them, began to say, Take heed that, none, that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are all the beginnings of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been seen, such, such has not been since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for, this, but for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened these days. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed, see, I have told you all, the, all things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender, and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near, at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the, time, when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the, ev in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest, coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, so it's a, it's a big session uh, section, and uh, let's just look at verse three and four, and uh, and we'll we'll conclude after that. So, verse three of Mark thirteen says, "Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, in these four." Uh, came up to him and asked him these questions. So verse three, we saw first in verse one that, that the disciples commented on the amazing buildings and uh, they drew Jesus' attention to them. See what amazing buildings are here. And then Jesus 
replies in verse 2 of Mark 13 by making a startling announcement. The temple is going to be destroyed. The stone's turned over. It's going to be ruined. In verse 3 here, we're looking at there's been a time between the two. Apparently, Jesus walks on up ahead of them, up the steam, uh, through the valley of Kidron, and then uh, he's walking in the western direction out of, out of the east side of Jerusalem, walking up the steep embankment of the Mount of Olives toward Bethany, where they stay the night. And uh, when at the summit or near the summit, they, it says, he sat down on the Mount of Olives. That means upon the Mount of Olives. So we can assume he's near near the top there area, and he sat down on the Mount of Olives. So Mount of Olives is 150 feet higher than, than Jerusalem, and the temple and everything is there. And so there's a, that valley separating the two. It's likely getting dusk. This was the day Jesus was in the temple all day. They leave the temple, and uh, it's, it's, it's evening time, likely. They're facing west, and in facing west, the sun's probably setting in the west, and you can just picture this because it would have been this panoramic view of the sunset and all, all the city of Jerusalem and the temple. They'd be looking at this. Beautiful view, really. Beautiful. I mean, you don't have the glaring street lamps or the weird LED blue light going on and stuff like that. There would be, there would be lights here and there being lit, fires and so forth, but then just the city and the sunset, it would have been, it would have been a real splendor. And remember that Herod's temple was covered with plates of gold and white tile. So the sun would be hitting it from the west and shining on it all. It would have been a, a really a beautiful and amazing sight. And then in verse four, they come up to him and they ask him, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Things, what things? <laughs> when will these things be? the things that Jesus spoke of. But more than that, there's, there's much more to it. They, they actually ask him a, a double question. And in verse four, they, they are asking first, when? And then they ask second, what? When will these things be time? What will be the sign? What do we look for to know it's near the time? When will these things be? It, that indicates that they know a lot more is going to be happening than the temple being destroyed. Things being plural. When will these things be? Jesus said the temple is going to be destroyed in the stones. Oh, when is that going to happen? No, not just the temple and the stones. They knew that it was, there had to be a lot more events to happen for this temple, which is a strong fortress of a place, and all the stones, Jerusalem situated as a fortress up on the mountaintops to be destroyed. In other words, there's got to be more events. When will these things be? In their minds, they understand there's more happening. Catastrophic events related to other events. And they accepted, by the way, let's not overlook this, that Jesus said it would happen. They took it as fact. It's going to happen. They didn't, that's not going to happen. They didn't retort with any kind of uh, argument. They said, when is it going to happen? Right? They believed it would happen because Jesus said it would happen. And everything that they understood, here's the Messiah. Everything he said so far is happening. And we don't understand it all. We need more information from him. But when he, he, we saw him heal lepers, we saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus says things and they happen. We just saw him uh, tear apart all the wisest scribes and Pharisees and the priests and the temple and the leaders. And they all attacked him with all these political questions and other questions. And, and, he, and he was answered them and they couldn't answer him a word and he asked them one question then they can't answer it i trust this man i trust jesus so when are these things going to happen more is going to happen than just that one event but they want to know when it would happen and, and the second what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled so two parts there two questions what, are, what will be the sign when it's going to be fulfilled. By the way, the word fulfilled is also accomplished. And it's, you know, King James or otherwise, it's a verb. It's a verb, fulfilled, accomplished. Matthew 24, verse 3 is the same scene and record of this. And, and, and it says, Matthew 24, verse 3, tell us when will these things be, question one, and what will be the sign of your coming, question two, 
at the end of the age. The sign of your coming at the end of the age. By the way, that's a noun, not a, it's a, it's a phrase that's a noun, a noun phrase, not a verb. So what you have in Mark is a verb and it's saying the same thing that's in Matthew, which is a noun, by the way. Two different ways of saying the same thing. It's, I think that's quite interesting just grammatically, but, um, but I was a failure in English. So all I know is this. When Mark says, when will these things be fulfilled or accomplished? He's not just talking about the destruction of the temple. Because when you read it further and understand, it's talking about this phrase as a unit, the end of the age and the Christ's coming. They assumed, and I think they assumed correctly, that this catastrophic event of the destruction of the temple will also include a lot more, like the ushering in of the king's kingdom. Uh, absolutely. Remember, last week we were talking about they just rejected the Messiah. When he walked out of the temple, he says it's going to be destroyed. He is the king. He is the high priest of that temple, rightfully so. He's the king over Israel. And, and they just rejected the king. And he says, they rejected me. He didn't say they rejected me, but they had. And, and it's all going to be destroyed. When is the Messiah going to bring in his kingdom? So their question relates to the destruction of the temple, but it assumes that the destruction will be related to this complex series of events culminating in the end of the age, the inaug which brings in the inauguration of the messianic kingdom, which there is a lot of prophecy about. And the Messiah is going to bring in his messianic kingdom, isn't he? And a lot of the zealots were looking for that. You're going to go, on the, go to the cross? What about your messianic kingdom? If you're God, save the world. Do something about the pain in the world. Do something about the suffering in the world. If you're good, how come this happens? Bring in your kingdom. When Jesus says that it's going to be destroyed, they know there's much more. That's what I'm saying. And they have been, get this, they've been longing for the Messiah to set up his rule and reign. He kept foretelling his death to them, saying, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And I'm, going to, I'm going to be killed. And that was hard for them to get. Why was it so hard for them to get that he's going to be killed? Because he's the king. He's the Messiah. He's going to rule and reign and overthrow the enemies and, and do, bring righteousness. So it was a hard concept. He's going to go die. That's why I like that phrase, the lamb and lion ministries. Not lion and lamb, lamb and lion. Because he's the lamb of God. He died for the sins of the world. And he's the lion of Judah who will return to rule the world. He's the one who rightfully has, has title to it. So here is, by the way, is something that sounds finally to them, whoa, he's gonna, the temple is going to be destroyed. Now he's talking action. Now he's not talking cross. He's talking kingdom. That's what is going on in their heads, okay? The Hebrew mindset, the Jewish mindset, what they understand, the king, that's, what they're, that's what's going on, I believe, with this. He's talking kingdom language, and this is, this is powerful stuff. So when's it going to happen? It's gonna, it harkens to them to several chapters in the Old Testament, one of which is Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. I know you have it memorized. The establishment of the messianic kingdom on earth, the, the inauguration of it from Jerusalem, Zechariah 14. They, they saw the rejection of the leadership of Israel. They saw that. They saw the un beatable power of Jesus and all that he did. The, the unstoppable love of who, who is toward, toward people who were humble of heart. You know, and, and they're thinking, he is the Messiah, and when it will he usher in his kingdom? And so they ask. That's a proper question. When are these things going to happen? What's the sign that will show us that this is the current time, where the man, man's power is going to come to nothing, and you're going to come to rule. And they use the word all, by the way. All these things. When, what will be the sign when all, verse 4, these things will be fulfilled? The word all is not in there by accident. It's talking about more than just the destruction of the temple, once again. It stresses the, the full consummation of all these crisis events. And so Jesus goes into it. And the feeling of the scene and the intensity of the disciples, I think, is present. We have the scene clearly portrayed for us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
Like, like they know the spot he sat when this was described and the scene before them of the panoramic view of Jerusalem and the disciples that were close to him, specifically these four, when this question was asked. It impacted them so much. There are 163, I counted them, verse, I did the math, not counted, uh, uh, verses recorded of this conversation in Matthew 24, in Mark 13, and Luke 21. A lot of scriptures recorded about what Jesus replied to these two questions. And so just imagine sitting up there on the hillside of the Mount of Olives and looking and seeing from, from the south to the north this panoramic view. And Jesus begins describing these prophetic events. I think that would have been powerful. You know, they, didn't have, they couldn't go to the movies. CGI wasn't a thing yet. <laughs> but when Jesus starts the power of story, the power of, of, of his words, he starts telling them what's gonna happen. I, could you just imagine sitting there? I, was, I won't do it but for time's sake, but I was gonna read the whole text to you again. Could you imagine Jesus just starting to tell them these things? Take heed, no one deceives you. And then he goes on, for many are gonna come in my name, I am he. They're gonna deceive many. And he just starts going and encouraging them and warning them and telling them nation's gonna rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. It's not just gonna be Jerusalem. This is gonna be global in effect. It's gonna be huge. There's gonna be earthquakes, famines, pestilence. And he just starts describing what it sounds like happened in the Exodus with Moses and the plagues. And he's just like, it's so dynamic and so broad and huge what he starts telling them. It would be a surreal, powerful moment to be sitting there listening to him, I think. I think their minds would have been so wrapped up and were in all that he was saying, imagining the words he's sharing as they look out over the city. So they ask him, when and what? When will this temple be destroyed? What will be the sign of the end of the age? And in closing, just thinking about that uh, sign. Oh, can you grab Lloyd for, for me, Steve, please? A sign is a, is a portent or a um, harbinger, harbinger. It's a forewarning. That's what a sign is. A sign tells you something's going to happen, right? And some people take sign as a superstitious thing. Oh, just think very practical. When I see a sign that says yield on the road, that means there's probably traffic coming from the other direction, right? Or from, from the side of me or something like that. Signs tell you what's going to be coming, what's going to happen, right? And, and so it's a sign. When there's a flashing yellow light, you know, it's telling you when you're driving up island, a red light's coming up, slow down. It's real simple. And here's a bunch of flashing lights <laughs> that Jesus gives to us, many signs. And I bet most of us, by the way, know of when a tsunami is coming. What's the sign when a tsunami is coming? Who knows? What's that? The water is gonna retreat. Yeah, if you're at the beach and the water starts going way out and, and rapidly, they're like, well, that's a really strong tide. Ooh, look at the neat stuff. Wow, a, you know, a wheel well, let's go get it. You know, and you're going out there, not smart, right? Sirens should go off, right? If they're on time. Uh, that's a sign something's coming, right? So we can recognize the onset of, of some things and cataclysmic events that will begin. Well, can we recognize the sign of the end times, the signs of the end times? So um, Jesus is in control, he knows. And how things will unfold, he knows. And he's gonna share some of that with, with his church, with believers. So I believe that we should listen and take heed. I think that we should give our understanding to the subject of prophecy and, and, and just be encouraged and know that it's not beyond you. <laughs> you know, the Lord has some things to share with his church about prophecy and um, we, should, we should take the plain reading of the text and we, we, should, we should give our understanding to it and, and in our hearts desiring to know him and desire his coming more and more. Amen? Lord, thank you uh, for, for the time that we get to just preview what's coming up and, and the questions that your disciples asked and we desire that we would have a heart that is ready to gain instruction from you. 
Lord, as, as we uh, have an interest in news and world events, have an interest in what's happening, Lord, there's something to that that hearkens to a desire we have for things to be right. We don't want things to get worse, Lord. We want things to get better. But Lord, you foretell of a lot that's gonna happen. And in, in some ways, there's gonna be a promise that things are gonna get better in the world, but it's gonna get much worse before it gets totally better. And that's because you're patient. You're not willing that any should perish. You desire people to come to everlasting life. So Lord, as we look up, help us to also look out at the fields white for harvest. Lord, remind us that, that we are still in a time where your uh, grace is being extended to thousands and millions across the globe. And we, and we pray for the persecuted church around the world, Lord, that they would be comforted and encouraged and in your word. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to be about your business while we await your return. In Jesus' name, amen.